Good morning, everyone, and welcome to ICA's online service. I'm Pastor JV, and we're excited to have you here today in the beginning parts of 2022. So we are praying for you that your new year is going to be good and fantastic, and that 2022 is not 2020 part two, because I think that is a movie that nobody wants the sequel to, right? Uh, we don't need a repeat of 2020. So uh, we're hoping that your new year is going to be bright and good. Today we're diving into a book called First Samuel, uh, which has some parallels to our current time. You know, we live in some crazy times where the world seems to not make a lot of sense. And as we dive into scripture, we're touching on a time that also didn't make a lot of sense. So if you have your Bible, I hope you have your coffee and your tea and your Bible and you're ready to go today. Uh, we are going to dive in. This book happens at a time in the Bible that is called the book of the Judges. And Judges was kind of the Wild West of the Old Testament. Uh, you would see just crazy stuff. It was sort of a mix between uh, Korean drama and squid games sort of going on. The people of Israel had been brought out of Egypt and they'd been given the law of God uh, to live and they were free. They didn't have a king or anything like that. They just had the law, a way that you were to live, and then they were free to live it. And they had uh, a priesthood that would help them decide between problems and between them and their neighbors. But during this time period, we see that people wandered away from God and they wandered away from the law of God. And as such, their own behavior changed towards one another and the entire place became lawless. I mean, if, if it was a uh, Western, uh, you know, it, we were seeing saloon doors, and I guess they didn't have six shooters back then, but maybe slingshots, right? This is kind of the world that we're growing up in here in Judges. So if you read it, you'll see what I mean. And into this time, the people would cry out to God when things got really bad, and God would raise up for them deliverers who the Bible calls judges. And we're going to learn about uh, this man named Samuel, who is the last of the judges, and he would transition Israel from this period into the beginning of the monarchy or the first kings of Israel. He would be an amazing man of God, a man of faith, and he would anoint the first kings that God would ever bring to Israel, and he would anoint David, who would be the king that God foretold that the Messiah would come through. And so Samuel is a mighty man of faith. But the story of Samuel does not begin with his faith. Like many instances in the Bible, God begins with what is small to come up against the mighty things of the world. You know, sometimes we can feel incredibly small when we look at the world and we look at its problems and we feel very powerless to affect it. But when we dive in here, we're going to see that in the face of great opposition... In the face of the powers of the world, the Lord often begins with what is very small to fight what is great. That God often uses what seems foolish in the eyes of the world to shame the wise. And he uses what is weak in the eyes of the world to shame the strong. And the faith of Samuel begins not with himself, but with his mother. So we're going to start this story out. Uh, at this time, things are going crazy uh, the people of Israel have cried out to God, and he's raised up a champion for them called Samson. Maybe you've read about this guy. He's sort of an Old Testament Hercules who is beginning to free them from the power of a group called the Philistines. And 
there is a high priest living at this time in a place called Shiloh. The temple of God doesn't exist yet. It's just a tent. And the Israelites would go there to the priest in Shiloh. And the Lord is beginning to deliver them. He's promised that he would start to deliver them. And so we pick up this story during this time period in 1 Samuel 1, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, There was a man named, named Elkanah who lived in Ramah in the region of Zuf in the hill country of Ephraim. So uh, he was basically a descendant of Joseph. And he was the son of a bunch of people. You don't need to remember their names. But Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah did not. So the story begins quite simply with a family. And it lists two women who are wives of Elkanah. The one was Hannah. Uh, Hannah's, her name means to be gracious. It comes from the word Hanan, to be gracious. And she definitely lives up to that name, as we're going to see through the rest of this story. Her, uh, the other woman that he's married to is called Penina. And that word means coral, like red coral. Maybe she had wild uh, red hair, we don't know. Uh, so here are these two women, and he is married to both of them. I, I want to pause before we keep going here and talk about this a little bit. Uh, these stories from the Old Testament are from thousands of years ago. And we see polygamy here. And people kind of wonder about that sometimes. You know, did God approve of uh, polygamy? Uh, two notes I want to make. One, for, especially for our young people that grow up today. We have to be very careful about judging past cultures based on our current situation. Uh, where we are in history today is the result of decisions that were made along the way to help us get to where we are now, right? So hopefully we've made some improvements as we've gone along. And so we don't want to look back with a critical eye on past generations, but we do want to learn from and understand what they did right and what they did wrong. Um, if we look at polygamy in the Old Testament, we saw that it was often a pragmatic thing. Men would die in battle, women would die in childbirth, and everybody was concerned about having a lot of kids. There was no government that took care of you. You just sort of took care of yourself, and uh, you had to go out and figure out how to survive. And in that world, uh, there were survival mechanisms that came in place. Women would often find uh, a shortage of men if they had died in battle, or they would find someone who could provide for and take care of them, and men were interested in having a lot of kids. And so we see that human beings came up with this solution. Now, does it work out? One of the things I will say is that there's no example in the Bible of a polygamous marriage that seems to work well. In the end, you always see that there's strife and conflict and often jealousy and insecurity that arise as one would naturally assume from a relationship like this uh, where you have people competing for the affection of one person. So the Bible doesn't put a stamp of approval on it. It simply says that it's what happened. If we want to look for God's plan for relationships, Jesus tells us in Matthew 19, 4 through 6, what God's ideal for relationships is when he says, haven't you read the scriptures? Jesus said, they record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two, but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. So the Bible's picture of relationships between men and women is one man and one woman for one lifetime and it goes back to the garden of eden where god set this up he didn't set up adam and eight women or eve and eight men it was adam and eve and they formed the beginning of what is the family which is the basic structure for all of society where families are strong society is strong and i think it's one of the reasons why the devil attacks family as strong as he does if he can tear down family in the end he can tear down people and tear down society. Now, one of the things I do want to point out, though, is that while we sometimes um, can be critical of older societies and the things that they did, I think we're kind of on weak ground in our modern day. 
Uh, because I don't know that we're much better. In our modern time, men believe they can sleep with as many women as they want, and they don't even have to marry them to do it. You know, at least Elkanah had to marry these women and provide for them for the rest of their lives. In our day, uh, some men expect uh, that they will get sexual favors after two dates. Uh, and so I think, you know, we really need to be cautious in our modern times. Young people, uh, really be careful. Whenever a society drifts, from God's ideal for relationships. God's ideal is you with one person and you being faithful to that one person and you saving yourself for that one person. And where societies have drifted from that, they end up having a less fulfilling relationship. We'll see it here in this example, it's less fulfilling, but in our day, it's less fulfilling too. And, and I would caution us that uh, you know, maybe if you're getting your relationship advice from influencers on Instagram uh, who feel that they have to take off half their clothes uh, in order to get likes and attention, that may not be the best place to get your long-term relationship advice. So pay attention to where you get your advice. I recommend that God, who created relationships, probably the best place to go uh, for your advice on that. So that was free. Uh, and now we're going to dive back in here. So here's this couple. It says, each year, Elkanah, the husband, would travel to Shiloh. That was the place that the the resting place of the Ark of God was. So the tent of the tabernacle where they would meet with the Lord would be here. And that's where the priests were. And they would worship and sacrifice to the Lord of Heaven's armies at the tabernacle. The priests of the Lord at that time were two sons of Eli... Hophni and Phinehas. We're going to get back to them later. They're actually not very good guys. On the days Elkanah presented his sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to Penina, his one wife, and each of her children. And though he loved Hannah, he would give her only one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. So we're going to paint a picture here. We have Elkanah and two wives... Penina has a lot of kids, but she is not as loved. And then you have Hannah, who has no children, uh, but her husband loves her a lot. Uh, And we see here that he comes and he gives a thank offering to God. And the way that it worked then was you would give a gift back to the Lord to say thank you for his provision. Uh, Part of it would be taken by the priests and offered to God. Uh, Part of it the priests would take as their portion. And then the rest of it would be given back and you would hand it out to your loved ones as, and celebrate together. And so he would give to Penina, he would give to the kids, and then he would give one portion to Hannah. Depending on what Bible you read, some say he gave a double portion and some one portion. Some people are confused, like why is one version say this? Uh, it depends on if you're looking at the Greek or the Hebrew. Uh, it's just that the language is a little obscure. But what it, what it literally says is he gave a portion with two faces. And so people try to figure out, well, what does that mean? Is that a double portion or is that, you know? But the most likely explanation of giving it with two faces was that he's coming to give thanks to God and he is thankful to God for his family. But when he gives to Hannah that portion, his thankfulness is also mixed with grief and sadness because he knows how much she wants to have children. In Hannah's day... Women didn't have careers. There weren't huge career opportunities in companies and businesses or even schools. Uh, You know, families just survived. And for women, a huge part of their calling was having children. That was what they uh, felt meant to do. So every woman at this time is going to feel the calling or the purpose in her life is to provide children into this world. And when you can't do that, there's a real sense that your purpose isn't being done. And I know that for some people, even today, not being able to have kids can be uh, such a wounding thing, uh, especially when you feel like a huge part of what you feel made to do is to be a mother or to be a father and to have a family. And so it was the same thing here. Uh, Hannah would grieve because she couldn't have children. In verses 1 through 6, it gets even worse. It says, so Penina... The other wife would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Year after year, it was the same. Penina would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle, and each time Hannah would be reduced to tears 
and would not even eat. So now we're really getting into Korean drama. So you have these two women. Uh, I mean, imagine how hard this is for Hannah. Not only is she not having kids, but she has to share a husband with this woman, and this other woman mocks her mercilessly for not having any uh, children. I mean, this is one of those stories that if Hannah uh, was of poor character, you might end up with uh, Penina being on a missing persons list. Uh, so this is what she deals with, and her husband uh, is trying to make it better. And ladies out there, you know sometimes what can happen when your husband tries to make it better. Uh, you know, the husband may mean well, uh, but he still has a man brain, and sometimes a man brain does not entirely understand uh, how best to help his wife feel better. So uh, this is going to be the first big fail that we're going to see here towards Hannah uh, is her husband. He means well, but he kind of fails here. In verse 8, uh, Elkanah comes and says, Why are you crying, Hannah? Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than 10 sons? Yeah, so um, not his best move. Uh, men, if you're taking any notes at all on like what to do and what not to do, uh, yeah, this is not the thing to say. If, if you're wanting to have kids with your wife and you guys are having a hard time having kids, um, telling her, hey, aren't I better than 10 sons is probably not your best move. So he may have spent some time on the couch after that one. I don't know. So what does Hannah do? She's uh, in a world where she is looking for her calling. And, you know, we're, we're talking these several weeks about hearing the call of God, being able to hear the voice of God and knowing what your calling is. And last week we talked a bit about how a calling isn't just a thing you do, but it is about who you are. And we're going to see this here with Hannah. She feels a sense of calling, a desire to fulfill something, and it is by having a family and contributing to the world through her kids and being a mother. And she doesn't see another avenue in life where she benefits the world or her husband. And so her answer throughout you know, her husband means well, but he doesn't do a good job. She's being attacked by this other woman uh, verbally. She's waited a long time on the Lord, and nothing has happened. So Hannah decides to earnestly seek the face of God. You know, when we want to hear God, we need to fervently seek Him. One of the things we can pull from Hannah is that she didn't just halfway go after God. She made it uh, a, a point that she was going to, with all of her being, begin to seek the face of God for this thing. When things got tough, she didn't turn to uh, other resources or self-help books or drinking or, uh, you know, daytime television. She didn't just occupy her time even, but she set her mind to seek the face of God. In 1 Samuel 1, 9, it says, Once after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Now Eli the priest was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance to the tabernacle or the tent of meeting. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. Now that's kind of a weird thing to say, but you have to understand, if you remember the story of Samson, there was a thing called a Nazarite. A Nazarite was someone who was completely dedicated to God. And they would never let the hair of the Nazarite get cut. That's why Samson, he was a Nazarite, uh, the moment his hair was cut, he lost his strength from God. You can read that story in Judges 13. Um, but so she's saying, I will make my son a Nazarite to you. Like, he will be dedicated wholly to you for his entire life, if you will hear my prayer. And she was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. You know, sometimes uh, when God has us wait a long time, it can drive us to that place where we begin to wholeheartedly seek the face of the Lord. 
And the scripture over and over encourages us with this idea of wholeheartedly seeking God. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, this is the Lord speaking. He says, if you look for me wholeheartedly with all your heart, you will find me. Hebrews eleven six says, it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Hannah's faith believed that despite her situation and the disappointments of how long she's waited, that God existed and that he would reward those who sincerely sought him. Psalm 57, verse 16 and 17 David wrote, you do not desire a sacrifice, Lord, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart. You know, one of the takeaways that we can take from this, if you are in a situation where you're wanting to hear the voice of God and you're wanting to know about his will for your life and his direction for your life, it is that persistent, faithful seeking of the face of God. It is a wholehearted devotion to him. In our day, it is easy to not be wholehearted. We have a lot of things to distract us from seeking God. And sometimes it is only in that moment of brokenness that we stop caring about, you know, maybe spending our time on Netflix or on other things and really going, I want to see the face of God. I want to see the face of God. And when we seek him in that way, God hears us and he responds. So here she is. She's in the church. She's seeking God wholeheartedly. She tells God, if you do this, then I will give my son to you. She makes a vow. Now, I do want to say, Jesus tells us in the New Testament, be careful about making vows because God will hold you to it. Do not lightly make a promise to God. He will hold you to it. Vows to God are serious. That's why a marriage is a vow. It is a promise and God holds you to that promise of faithfulness to that person. So God is not going to overlook a vow. That's why Jesus said, it's better to let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be a person who keeps your word, but be very careful about binding yourself to a vow because God will hold you to it. So she binds herself to a vow. And now we see Pastor Eli come up and he sees her there. And we would really expect that at this time in the story is when, uh, you know, the pastor shows up as the agent, the servant of God with like a wisdom from heaven, you know? He's heard the Lord, he sees this woman, God speaks to him, and he's coming to share with her a message of hope. And instead, we just see the next big failure, and it comes from Pastor Eli. In 1 Samuel 1, 12, as she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her. And he's seeing her lips moving, but he heard no sound because she's just praying in her spirit, but her lips are moving. He thought she had been drinking. So he says to her, must you come here drunk, he demanded? Throw away your wine, woman. So strike three. First, it's Penina mocking her. Second, Elkanah, the husband, trying to help out. Fails, and now Pastor Eli, complete crash and burn. Um, I think at any point, if anybody has a reason to be bitter, it is Hannah, right? Here the pastor comes, the guy who should be sensitive and see her moment of need, and instead he accuses her of being a drunk. I, I want to pause here for a second and look into this for a little bit. You know, um, Hannah has every reason to be hurt and wounded by what Eli just did. And I want to say that in the church, sometimes we're going to get hurt and wounded by people. I don't know um, in your experience, but many people, I have heard that experience that they say, I went to church, I had a bad experience with someone, right? Somebody in the church hurt me. It, maybe it was a congregation member. Uh, maybe it was a, a minister or a pastor. Somebody did something that may have hurt or offended them. And because of that, they made a decision maybe not to attend church or, you know, it, it it diminished or discouraged them from beginning to seek the face of God. And uh, it brings up an important point that in the church are human beings and human beings are fallible. And 
I think all of us at some point in our life are going to be hurt by somebody who is in our church. But I would say the same thing of our family. Mostly in our family, we have people who love and care about us, but there's times where they let us down and there's times where they hurt us. And that's because we're human. I mean, the Bible is filled with stories of human beings that make mistakes. And even the greatest men and women of faith in the Bible have moments of failure where they let themselves down or they let others down. And so we can't promise that people in the church are going to be perfect. Even if everybody was perfect, the moment you show up or I show up, uh, there's at least two imperfect people there now, right? So uh, like a family, people aren't perfect. And sometimes uh, we accidentally hurt each other. And sometimes pastors will do the same thing. Pastors, although 90% of all pastors mean well, and are working hard at serving others and being there for them. They're still human beings, and sometimes they make mistakes. When we look at Eli, uh, Eli was probably a good guy, mostly. Uh, he, he, was, he was somebody that respected the house of God. He kept the commandments of God. I think as he got older, he got kind of disconnected, maybe, from the Spirit of the Lord. He clearly wasn't hearing the voice of God on this one, and he wasn't being very sensitive Um, But we don't have examples of real sin in him except for one thing. Eli loved his sons to a point where he overlooked the wickedness of his sons. Because Eli's sons were terrible men. Uh, The Bible says that they were, uh, they robbed people. Uh, The Bible says that they would sleep with women who came to the house of God. Uh, These were wicked men. Eli warned them against their wickedness knowing that Look, if you are a pastor or a preacher and you are using your position uh, to, to rob people or to take advantage of people uh, or to be immoral, uh, you know, you're in real trouble. Eli told him, look, if you sin against another man, maybe God can intercede for you. But if you're sinning against God, who's left to intercede for you? And this brings up another discussion about pastors. Let's talk a little bit about pastors. Because, again, as I said before, I think 90% of pastors out there are going to be well-meaning people that work hard to serve uh, you and to serve others. They are seeking God in their own life, but they're still human beings, and they're going to make mistakes. All of us are on a faith journey together. And there's a danger sometimes here in Indonesia of, uh, you know, sometimes we put our pastors up on a pedestal, and we forget that they're human beings. In the Bible, there's only one hero. There's only one person that always got it right, and that was Jesus Christ. And he's the only one we should really put up on a pedestal. We should be grateful to and respect those that work hard and serve us well. But we have to be careful not to expect them to be uh, superhuman. Today, we live in a day of celebrity. And that has invaded the church as well. And I think we have to be cautious um, because... In the day of celebrity pastors, there have been times where people have been uh, led astray by leaders who are either um, openly uh, in falsehood and fraudulent um, or are trying to mislead people or are just in error. And I want to talk about this just a little bit because in 2 Peter 2 verse 1, Peter gives a warning about these kinds of people. He says, There were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teachings and their shameful immorality. And because of these teachers... The way of truth will be slandered. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get a hold of your money. God has condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. So the Bible is warning us that there will be false teachers. And I want to boil this down into two kind of categories. The first one is the cult leader. Uh, A cult is a group that looks a lot like Christianity, uh, but it deviates in the most important areas. So they're hard to spot sometimes because 90% of what they say can be true. They can come in and give you all the Ten Commandments and everything that you should do to be a virtuous person. But usually the area where they will disagree with the Bible is around the nature of Jesus Christ. 
Right? That's what they will attack. Yeah, yeah, Jesus was a good teacher, but he's not the son of God. He's not the way to salvation. Because the devil could care less how many commandments you obey as long as you don't come to faith in Jesus Christ, who is God's one way for us to be forgiven and come to salvation. So the cult uh, will disguise itself as Christianity, but it will deviate in the core principles of Christianity, usually around the area of the nature of Jesus Christ. So if you have people coming to your door and they disagree on who Jesus is, that he's not the son of God, he's just an angel, he's just a wise teacher, that's how you identify those kinds of leaders. The second kind of leader is the uh, Christian leader who is the false teacher. And the way that we identify this in our celebrity uh, society is generally you can spot these guys because they never preach Anything about repenting of sin, uh, turning towards the Lord, you know, living a holy life or anything like that. Their entire message is a giant self-help book about how you can be the best you and live the best life that you could ever live and have the most material blessings that you can ever have if you give generously to that particular pastor. And, you know, and you hear these guys a lot of times coming up, how they need a new mansion or a, you know, a new airplane or something like that. And that as long as you provide their new airplane, God's going to provide for you. And so, um, you know, this is, this is one of the earmarks of these kinds of guys. They don't teach the truth about Jesus Christ and they turn God into just a means for financial gain. How do we be careful not to be led astray by false prophets, false teachers, and false leaders. Jesus told us in Matthew 7, 15 through 17, he warned us about this. He said, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but they are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. That is by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from a thorn bush or figs from a thistle? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, you can identify people by their actions. Jesus warns us to know what they do and to pay attention to what they do. If you are being led along by a movement that says, oh, our goals are good, our aspirations are good, what we want to accomplish is good, but their methods are wicked or harmful or do evil to others, it's not good. And you need to be careful not to partner yourself with things that cause you to sin against others, even if their end intention they say is good. Like throughout history, nobody that did horrible things in the world, terrible world leaders and everybody else, they always had great motives, great intentions and great goals. It was their methods and their means that were evil. And we need to be wise to this. How can we be wise and that is to know the word of God yourself. Church, this is so important. If you go to the bank, the way that they know counterfeit money is not by studying all the counterfeit money. The way that they know a counterfeit is by studying the real thing. And one of the dangers in the church today is that Christians get all of their information from a pastor or a leader. But we don't open the Bible ourselves to read it ourselves to know what it says for ourselves. You know, my desire is that everybody out there who listens to this would not just believe something because I say it, but that you would be a student of the word yourself, and then you can compare what I say to scripture, and then you're able to know whether what I'm saying lines up with the Bible or whether it doesn't. You know, sometimes we will go in on Sunday, and we'll hear a 30-minute uh, message, and that's supposed to get us through our whole week, and that's kind of like somebody, you know, eating breakfast on Sunday and not eating again through the whole week. It's, it's not enough. We need to be a people that know God and a people that have our own relationship with God. What we're going to find here with Hannah is that she was a woman that had her own relationship with God. Hannah's relationship with God was not tied to individuals. It was not tied to her pastor. It was not tied to her husband. It wasn't tied to a celebrity uh, leader. It wasn't tied to any other individual. It was her and God. She knew God. And therefore, Hannah's faith was not shaken just because she had a bad experience necessarily with her pastor or she even had a bad experience with her husband. 
She continued to believe in God, even though she had that bad experience. And I would encourage us, if you've had a bad experience with a person, you've had a bad experience with your pastor, you know, try to make that right. People make mistakes sometimes. You know, I'm not talking about them just, you know, really abusing you or something, but just everyday things where sometimes we can be offended. Don't let that keep you from God. Or if somebody has a moral failure who's a leader in the church, don't let that affect your relationship with God. I remember when I was a kid, uh, I, my family didn't go to church, but we knew about these, you know, TV preachers. There was one of them who was very well known, and he had a moral failure. You know, he had a, a, a moral fallout, and it was big news. And as a kid, uh, not a churchgoer at all, I, I remember hearing these stories of Christians that sort of lost their faith in God because this guy had a moral failure. And even at, at my young age, I thought that was strange because I couldn't understand why why they thought God changed sometimes because a man made a mistake. You know, God is unchanging and he can't change just because of what people do. Uh, in the same way that a bad math teacher doesn't mean that math is no good or a bad language teacher doesn't mean language is useless. You know, God is unchanging. And Hannah and us need to have our own relationship with God. So remember, her name means gracious. And she's incredibly gracious to Eli here in verse 15. She says, Oh, no, sir, she replied. I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger. But I am very discouraged, and I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think I am a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. This is an incredibly gracious response. There are a lot of other responses that all of us could think that we might have said to Eli. Um, she had every reason at this point to be bitter. Bitter against God because she'd waited so long. Bitter about her life situation, living with Penina. Uh, and now bitter at the church because of a, of a foolish and, and careless response by Eli. But instead, Hannah lives up to her name. She is gracious. And credit to Eli at this point. Eli realizes he is wrong. You know, again, I don't think Eli was a bad guy. He's just a little out of touch. And when he realizes he's wrong... He answers her in verse 17. He says, in that case, Eli said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Thank you, sir, she exclaimed. Then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. The entire family got up early the next morning and went to worship the Lord once more, and then they returned home to Ramah. When Elkanah later slept with Hannah, the Lord remembered her cry, and in due time, she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I asked the Lord for him. The word, the name Samuel means heard of God. So she named her boy uh, heard of God because God heard her prayer for a son. And, you know, one of the points we want to bring home is that God hears our earnest prayers. Hannah wanted to have a family. She wanted a calling. She had a calling that she sensed on her life. She was confused as to why it wasn't happening. And in her mind, her contribution to the world would be her children. But God had a bigger plan than Hannah understood. You know, sometimes in our lives, we want something. And we can be really disappointed when God shuts a door or when he doesn't answer yet or he makes us wait. But often it is simply that God has a better or bigger plan plan than we can understand. Hannah only wanted a child, but God was going to give her a child that would change the world. God was going to give her a child that would shepherd the nation of Israel. God was going to give her a child that would anoint the first kings and would be a tutor to the king David, who would eventually be the forefather of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So the plan of God was far bigger than what Hannah could imagine. And God was going to do something miraculous. And he allowed Hannah to get to a point where she sought nothing but his face. She wanted nothing but his face. Where her faith grew. Where her devotion grew. Because it was going to be her faith and her relationship with God. That hunger with God. That he wanted her to pass on to this son. She only wanted children. But God planned for more. First Samuel 1.21. The next year, Elkanah and his family went on their annual trip to offer a sacrifice to the Lord and to keep his vow. 
Hannah did not go. She told her husband, wait until the boy is weaned. Then I will take him to the tabernacle and I will leave him there with the Lord permanently. Whatever you think is best, Elkanah agreed. Stay here for now. May the Lord help you to keep your promise. So she stayed home and nursed the boy until he was weaned. She had made a promise to God and now she has to keep it. This is one of the things we need to remember. Be careful about making your promises to God. He will hold you to it. One of the things we have to ask ourselves is, are we ready to sacrifice for God's calling? Hannah, this was her firstborn, and under Jewish law, every firstborn belonged to the Lord. But God had set up a system where they would be redeemed by making an offering, and the the tribe of priests, the Levites, would take the place of the firstborn. But Hannah has made a promise to God, there will be no Levitic substitution for me. My son will be given to you for ministry. I want to ask this question. If God calls your kids to ministry, will you see that as an honor or a curse? Will you give to God who calls uh, people to serve him in his church if he calls one of your sons and daughters? This is a question that comes to us. In our society, we want people to be pastors and we want people to be church leaders, but we don't necessarily want them to come from our own sons and daughters. It can be very fearful uh, or frightening for us to go, man, if I do that, I don't know that they're going to make a lot of money. You know, we know nobody's making money in ministry unless they're crooked. Um, You know, and so there's that fear that comes in. And yet Hannah had faith that if God had called one of her kids into ministry and service, that this was an honor to her and her family. That if God was giving her a son, she would give him to the Lord for ministry. And the end result, we're going to read here. It says in 24, when the child was weaned, Hannah took him to the tabernacle in Shiloh, right? After sacrificing a bull, they brought the boy to Eli. Sir, do you remember me? Hannah asked. I am the very woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked the Lord to give me this boy. He has granted my request, and now I am giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And they worshiped the Lord there. Hannah kept her word. Serving God is going to cost us something. You know, Jesus Christ said that if you want to follow me, you must take up your cross. The cross was the thing that Jesus died on. Jesus said anybody that saves his life will lose it, but who loses his life for my sake will find it. The word life in Greek is is a word like psyche, and it, it means your innermost being, your entire being. God is calling us to follow him, and it means laying ourselves down. So often in life, we want God to come into our life and give us our visions and our dreams and our wants. We want God to come in. We want to say, God, these are my plans. Bless my plans. But the Lord is looking for people that will say, Lord, here are my wants and here are my dreams, but I lay them down on the altar. What do you want with me? What do you want with my life? Show me what you want and I will follow after you. Hannah was this kind of a woman. From Hannah, as we close, we get some lessons here. If we want to know the call of God in our life and want to hear his voice, we need to seek the face of God like Hannah showed us. She was somebody who earnestly sought the face of God. It wasn't halfway. With her whole heart, she sought the face of God. We need to learn to persevere even as Hannah persevered. The Bible says that we should persevere as we seek after God. Jesus told stories about not giving up and hanging on until the Lord comes to you. She persevered until the time came when the Lord answered her prayer. We need to be willing to sacrifice to God the things he asks of us and to put our whole life into his hands. You know, we can ask ourselves this question. Am I... Is my whole life belong to the Lord? Does my whole heart uh, seek him? Does my whole heart love him? Or is God just something I do? I have my plans and I'm hoping that he helps my plans. Or am I seeking his plans for my life? Samuel would become a man 
of purpose, a, a man who was important. He would shepherd the entire nation of Israel. He would lead them uh, through times of difficulty, and he would lead them into the first kings, uh, into deliverance uh, from their enemies. He would help set that up. He was a, a man who tutored those who were great. But his faith begins here with his mother. You know, as we look at the life of Hannah, one of the things we can pull away is what example of faith are we passing on to our kids? You know, if we only expect that Eli the pastor or, you know, somebody else is going to show our kids what to do, uh, most of their time in our lives is spent with us. The first place that they see faith comes from us. Let, let us show faith to our kids. You know, before, when they're young, pray with them before they go to bed. Read scripture to them. Let them see you as a family pray together. It is in those places that they see that example. Samuel's faith would be the legacy of Hannah. May great faith be our legacy as well. Let's pray. Lord, as we look at the lives of those who have gone before us, we thank you for telling us their stories, telling us their struggles. These are people that were like us, and we get to see how you responded to them so we can understand how you might respond to us. And God, you have shown us that in Hannah, in a time of great turmoil in her world, where she was someone with the least amount of power, you were going to use her to set in motion events that would change the world. God, as we sometimes feel powerless in life, let us know that we are not powerless when we begin to seek your face. We are not powerless when we begin to pray to the Lord and that your mighty hand moves in response to those that will earnestly seek you and that if we seek you with our whole heart, you will be found by us. You will be found by us, Lord, and we can be a people who are known by our faith and who hear the voice of God. I pray for everybody who's out there today that your blessing would be on them, God. I pray your blessing over our families. And may you watch over and care for us and bring us uh, back together next week. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, guys. I hope you have a fantastic week. And we hope to see you again right here next week for part three. Thank you for joining us today at ICA Online. We hope you have a great Sunday. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. God bless. ICA Kids Department has prepared children's church materials for you and your kids. You can download them at bit.ly forward slash ICA Kids online. Follow ICA Kids on Instagram to get the latest updates from ICA Kids. Giving to the ministry at ICA has never been easier. Just scan this QR code on the screen or visit icasby.com forward slash giving for more options. If you need prayer, we want to connect with you. Visit bit.ly forward slash ICA prayer online and let's believe God together for a breakthrough in your life. ICA prayer service on Zoom happens every Tuesday at 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. You can check our Instagram on Tuesdays to get the meeting ID. Join the prayer service and let's grow our faith together. Follow ICA social media on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Spotify. There you will find important information, playlists, devotions, and interesting content and updates for you. We also have a brand new online church experience at icasby.online.church. One of the easiest ways to access our online service is to download the Church Center app. Once installed, just click on the church icon and it will take you straight to our online service. The Church Center app is your one-stop shop for all things ICA. Download the Church Center app from your app store today.